Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 49 of Surah At-Tawbah, he says, and among them, some say, grant me leave and test not my faith. Behold, they have fallen, they have failed the test and truly hell encompasses the disbelievers. If you recall, my dear brothers and sisters, we've been speaking about the reaction of the companions of the Holy Prophet ﷺ when he called upon them to join him on a military expedition in Tabuk to face off against the superpower of the time, the Roman Empire. And in the previous verses, you find that many companions came forward and put forth excuses asking the Holy Prophet ﷺ to exempt them, to excuse them from participating in the battle. Now up until now, the excuses that have been given were logistical excuses. Some of them may have said that it's too hot, the journey is too long, we don't have horses, we don't have swords. So the verses that we've covered are verses where the Sahaba are giving logistical excuses to the Prophet. They have to tend to family needs, they have to tend to their farm because it's the time of harvest, they lack the resources to participate. But interestingly here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares another type of excuse that was given. Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ ذَنْ لِي وَلَا تَفْتِنِّي Here, this specific ayah was revealed because a man by the name of Jadd ibn Qais, Jadd ibn Qais was one of the companions of the Prophet and he was known as a munafiq, as a hypocrite. He comes to the Prophet, so the Prophet as we've mentioned in the previous sessions, after the conquest of Mecca, Rasulullah receives intelligence that the Romans are planning an invasion. And the Prophet is calling upon his companions to join him on this long journey to the border, the Roman border, the Syrian frontier. Jadd ibn Qais, he comes to the Prophet and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I want you to give me permission to stay behind. Why? Because I'm afraid. Listen to this. He says, I'm afraid that if I see the fair ladies, of the Roman, the fair Roman ladies, I'll be so attracted to them that I might get, I may be distracted. I might abandon my responsibility. I may fall into haram. So he's telling the Prophet ﷺ that I'm afraid that I may not be able to control my desires if I see Roman women. Now, what type of excuse is Jadd ibn Qais giving? He says, Give me permission to stay so I don't commit haram, so I don't fall into haram, because if I see the fair-skinned women of the Roman Empire, I might not be able to control myself. So here Jadd ibn Qais, he gives a religious justification. So in the previous ayat, the justifications, the excuses that were given by the companions were logistical. Here is an example of someone opting out of their religious responsibility and they're giving an ethical justification for it. Now how does the Prophet ﷺ respond to this? The Prophet's attitude is very simple. Rasulullah doesn't force them. He doesn't force anyone or compel anyone to join him in battle because the Prophet's mindset, the Prophet's attitude is that Islam doesn't need you. Rather, you need Islam. 
I'm giving you an opportunity. you brothers and sisters how skillful shaitan is in causing people people to deviate shaitan is able to provide religious religious excuses for you to go astray some modern examples are you know many of us we work in corporate america you know we work in a non-Muslim environment. And oftentimes, we have business meetings. There are luncheons, there are dinners, and alcohol is being served. Now, some people sit at the table, even though it's haram, it's forbidden, and they provide what? They put forward a religious justification. They say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded me to provide for my family. And if I don't sit, if I sit at the, if I don't sit at the same table as my managers, as my bosses, what will happen? I won't be able to fulfill my religious responsibility of maintaining my family. In other cases, for example, we shake hands with the opposite gender and we provide a religious justification. We say, oh, this is not a big deal because Islam is a deen of akhlaq. And in this culture, it's bad akhlaq to pull your hand away. So again, shaitan, shaitan has, he has a lot of experience. He's had experience from the time of Adam and he's dealt with many prophets, many different believers. He knows how to cause people to go astray. He knows how to mislead. And this ayah is an example of failing the test of faith by succumbing to a false religious Justification. Allah says, So the likes of Jadd ibn Qais is afraid of joining the Prophet because he, he thinks that maybe I will commit sin. I will be infatuated when I encounter the beautiful women of Rome. But Allah says, Allah fil fitnati saqatu. You've already failed the test by not joining the Prophet. This was the test. But you failed the test of faith when you decided to stay behind. So you're trying to safeguard your faith by remaining in Medina because you think that you might become tempted if you see. The women of Rome, Allah says, Allah fil fitnati saqatu. Behold, they have already failed the test because they have failed to support the Messenger of God. Allah fil fitnati saqatu. Wa inna jahannama la muhiyatun bil kafirin. Allah says, and truly hell, the hellfire, encompasses the disbelievers. Now this is an interesting part of the ayah because it sheds light on the reality of Jahannam. Allah says, hell is already encompassing the disbelievers, which means that in the hereafter, all that is happening is that what is encompassing them in dunya manifests itself. Their rejection of faith, their life of sin, their rebelliousness, the reality of those actions, the hidden reality of those actions is what? Self-destruction. So they are already in hell, but they don't perceive it. Meaning it's already encircling them, it's surrounding them. So it's not that, I'll, that there is some arbitrary punishment known as hellfire. Hellfire is the hidden reality of sin. It's encompassing them now in alam al dunya but they don't perceive it. It will manifest itself to them in the hereafter. وَإِنَّ جَهَنَّمَ لَمُحِيطَةٌ بِالْكَافِرِينَ Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. I have a question from um, I 49 
uh, when you mentioned about Jaddu bin Khais, he yes. was this man who Allah mentions here. Um, are Ashas bin Khais, Khais bin Ashar al Kindi, and Jada bin Ashar, are they from this man's lineage, uh, Jaddu bin Khais's lin lineage? Because uh, all what they did in the battlefield of Karbala and with Imam Ali alayhi salam and with Imam Hassan alayhi salam, it's so all nothing but munafiqat. Maybe I thought that they must have got it from Jaddu bin Khais. You know, it, it's it's possible. I, I would have to see the, uh, I don't recall the tribe that Al Ash'ath ibn Qais is uh, is from. If they're because you know, Jaddu ibn Qais is from Bani Salma. So if if it turns out that uh, Ash'ath ibn Qais, Muhammad ibn Ash'ath, if they are from the tribe of Bani Salma, it's possible. I haven't seen it mentioned in the books of tafsir, but uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me. You know, the, these individuals. Their their hatred for the Ahlul Bayt seems to be transferred from one generation to another. So, uh, so he's from the tribe of Beni Salma. I would have to check, but uh, even even if they're not from you know his lineage, you know what they did to the Ahlul Bayt, you know suffices for them to be in the hellfire for for all eternity. But Jaddu ibn Qais, it's a, it's an interesting. Uh, Observation. I I would have to look into that, but it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if these if these munafiqeen are also related to each other. Uh, uh, this um, Ashas bin Khais al Kindi and um, Khais bin Ashas al Kindi and uh, Jada bin Ashas. They were all related to the first Khalifa, right? Um, uh, Abu Khahafa's uh, children. They, they, if I recall, they are they are relatives. They might not be directly from the same clan, but they there is. Uh, I I believe that there is some blood relations between. Them. You know, the, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, but uh, Abu Bakr, contrary to what is is mentioned by by uh, Sunni orthodoxy. And Sunni historians, Abu Bakr does not come from a prominent tribe. You know, Abu Bakr comes from uh, the tribe of, uh, of Ben Utain. Ben Utain is one of the, the lowest tribes in Arabia. And they are from such, you know, so you have certain tribes that are prestigious, they're prominent, they're well known, they're respected. Ben Utaim is they're really unknown to the point where when Abu Bakr becomes the first Khalifa, Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan was shocked. This is like someone from a village in the middle of nowhere becoming the president. That's how shocking it was. When Abu Bakr became the Khalifa, Abu Sufyan was who's who's Abu Bakr? He's from the tribe of Ben Utaim. And this is why, this is what prompted him to go to Imam Ali and say that I will join forces with you and will overthrow him. But of course, Amir al mumin knows that Abu Sufyan does not have pure intentions. He's a munafiq. So he, he declined his offer. So this goes to show you that, number one, and this, this requires you know, a detailed discussion. Abu Bakr was not wealthy. He was not a wealthy merchant who freed slaves and this is all these are all fabrications the the true abu bak was not wealthy he was not a merchant he came from a very poor family a very poor unknown tribe this is why abu sufyan was completely flabbergasted when he received news that abu bak was the khalif in fact people in arabia because of how dark the complexion of Benu Taim was, they had trouble distinguishing members of the clan of Benu Taim with the slaves. They they had trouble distinguishing between the slaves and the uh, the clan of Benu Taim. So they were not a well known tribe. Abu Bakr was not wealthy. He was not someone who was a merchant. 
These are all lies. It's propaganda. It's, it's Umayyad propaganda, and it has no reality. For those who actually do the research, he does not come from a prominent family, nor does he come from wealth. 